never let go Through the calm and through the storms Oh no, you never let go Every high, every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Just the voices, just the voices Sing it with us One more time, help us Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storms oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me amen are you thankful for his love and his mercy and his goodness and grace amen and that when we deserve justice he showed us mercy instead are you thankful for that amen i want us to go to the lord in prayer and we are going to pray once again as we always do that god will have his perfect will and way and that he'll speak to his church tonight and that god will be at the forefront center stage and that his voice will be heard not a person's let's pray most high god we honor you lord we honor you with praise with worship with gratitude lord thank you for this awesome miracle these several miracles we've heard tonight what amazing miracles god i thank you for also allowing us to see the heart of a man who is walking in faith regardless of outcome regardless of how he feels that lord he walks on water of your where you spoke and you told him to walk and god there it shouldn't hold him up but lord he's walking anyway because you said come and i thank you lord jesus that by faith lord we'll see a miracle in that life lord I ask right now that you take over the message that God is, you broke the bread with your disciples that night before you went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, I pray you take us to that upper room. Pray God you pull out a chair for us and that Lord, we feel the hard wood under our feet and that we can smell the dust, Lord Jesus, in the air and we'll smell the robes, Lord, that still have the smell of donkey on them and the outside air. Lord, I pray you take us into that atmosphere as that candle burns, Lord, and we feel the warmth of it. Take us to the upper room tonight, we ask God. And I thank you, Lord, for speaking divinely in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, praise team. Amen. We are continuing a series on your last meal. At the last meal, you have opportunities that you may not have at other times. I want to go immediately to Psalm 23 and verse 5, and I want to share something with you that perhaps will be new to you. Most of you have read Psalm 23. Some of you have memorized it. But in verse number 5, there's something that I found extremely interesting. It said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now, because of the way we are programmed to think, when we read this verse, we tend to get excited and immediately we think, ha ha, look at me enemies, my daddy has prepared a table for me in the middle of your trap. And we get excited and we have a little fit and we dance and shout and we say, you know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and we want to go uh, and just shout the victory. But I, I started seeing something here that you usually don't hear. And I want to explain some of this. Let's go to Philippians 4 and 7. First of all, it is absolutely true that our God protects us. He protects us from harm, protects us from enemies and other things. But look at Philippians 4 verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard. Someone say guard. guard. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's good news, church. The peace of God, it already surpasses on the interstate of our understanding. It surpasses our all understanding. But yet he's saying that it's going to do something. It'll guard your hearts and minds. Some of us need help in that area. Can I get an amen? We can leave a service where our faith is at a peak, and before we get home in the driveway, we're already getting worried about something that hasn't happened yet or about this certain bill or how am I going to deal with this or that. And You, th you think God would sit up there on his throne uh, asking us, did you already forget so quickly what I just did in your life? So we must guard our hearts and minds, and the way we do that is by allowing the peace of God to bypass and surpass our own 
own understanding. Psalm 61 verse 3 said, For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. These are great encouraging scriptures, brother. Uh, it's something that I would love to read if I was in a, a, a tough spot and had people maybe attacking me. I like to see that the Lord will be a strong tower, but I want to go back to Psalm 23 because I began getting a very different perspective about what God was saying through the uh, psalmist David. Paul, if you think ahead to the book of Ephesians, go ahead and pull that up on the screen. Paul was very specific when it came to warfare, and I'm going to tie this in in a moment because this is very important. We don't forget this point. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not, now did that say not, or did it say do? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. If you or I have ever prayed the prayer, God, get them back for what they did to me and move fast, then this scripture is to help us understand better. That we need to go back to the old rugged cross where that they had pierced Jesus in his hands and feet and placed a crown of thorns on his head, blasphemed him, and you know what come out of his mouth? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We need to understand what God is saying when he prepares a table before us, that it's not so that we can gloat or we can say, ha, enemy, look what God did. Look what the Lord has done. We'd like to kick into a little bit of that and get, get the drummer right there behind us at the, at the table. But God's saying, I've got something very, very specific I want to show you regarding preparing my table before you in the presence of your enemies. The psalmist David did not write this Psalm 23 just by chance. He was inspired by the Spirit of God. And in verse 5, he mentioned the anointing. How well King David remembered Shepherd David. How well the king on his throne that had many people that he could command on a whim to go out and fight his battles. How quickly he remembered when writing this that it wasn't that long ago that daddy would call and say, hey, go check on your brothers. Jesse would call David and say, hey, the sheep need to be carried to water, David, so I need you to go out there like a good young man. You do what you're supposed to do. And then one day, there was a call that came out to the pasture. And uh, uh, someone, I don't know exactly who, but someone ran, one of the servants possibly, and grabbed hold of David and said, your daddy needs you now. And David probably wondered what in the world's going on. And he had, I would think, noticed none of his brothers were out in the field. They weren't hanging out around the house. And when he walked in the door, everyone is likely staring at him. And he walks, he crosses the threshold, and daddy's looking, thinking, what in the world is this prophet Samuel thinking? I've showed him the best of the best. I've started with my eldest son, and I've come down to the next to the last, and now he's calling for the other. And here David steps into the room, and we remember the story that Samuel the prophet, led by God, lifts up his vessel and pours the anointing oil on the head of David. It's very important. That no matter how high up you get in hierarchy, no matter how blessed you are, that you always remember the days when you were a shepherd. You always remember the times where that people didn't bow when you walked through town. Matter of fact, they said, hey, fetch me some water out of that well, boy. And, and we need to remember what it was like before God elevated us. But one of the most important things I saw here in Psalm 23 is right after he mentions his enemies, he said, you have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now that's what we refer to, church, as overflow. You will hear people shouting the victory when a, an evangelist stands up before the church and says, God is about to move with overflow. They're like, whoa, glory to God, give me more than I can take. Overflow, Holy Ghost, overflow. And we get excited about it. But David was trying to show us something by the Spirit of God that overflow is not just about you. See, you can only handle so much. Once you're full, you're full. So overflow means God has filled me to the point where I can no longer handle any more. And everything else he pours goes over the edge. 
Now, why in the world would God do that and mess up his beautiful dishes and the table spread? Why in the world is God gonna keep pouring the sweet tea until it overflows the cup and mama gets mad saying, I hope you're gonna get a rag and clean that up, son. I mean, I mean, why would God want to overflow and run David's cup over? Well, let's remember one more time. You, uh, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, wait a minute. If God's overflowing in me and I've already got as much as I can handle for the moment, then the overflow must be for somebody else that is in the room. Luke chapter four, verse 18 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Did you know that this anointing wasn't just for Jesus? He said, there's some oppressed people out there. There's some who are broken. There's some who need an encouraging word and I have brought an anointing not so that I can start a bus ministry, pitch a tent, and have every bit, every, all the people in Judea come out and give me five denarius apiece so that I can go buy me another house. No, the anointing that was on the life of Jesus Christ was so he could pour into those who needed what he had. Amen? So when you start saying, God, anoint me, anoint me, anoint me, pour it on, pour it on, you need to realize something, that there is very likely some people in the room with you, and I'm speaking in the spiritual realm, people in the room who are going to need what you aren't able to contain. Uh Uh-oh, it's getting good now. Come on, somebody, get with me. When you overflow, you have as much as you can handle. Let's talk about enemies. Now, we know we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but I don't think I would be unscriptural to say there are people on the planet who are your enemy. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anybody hate you, but there are people who hate other people. Maybe you've hated other people before because of what they did to you, but enemies are those who wish to harm you and to uh, destroy you and tear down your character. And for some reason, there's, they, they get this calling on their life for Facebook ministry. <clears throat> and they feel led to go and name names and to share things about people. And I'm thinking, my goodness, are you not man enough or woman enough to uh, call them up and say, hey, I need to come meet with you and let's talk through this. Uh, No, instead, let's hide behind a a 13 or, no, let's get bigger now, a 26-inch screen and, and let's play the big bad person who wants to share gossip. Come on, it's a calling. It's gotta be a calling. They're so blessed and anointed by some spirit to do it. I don't think it's the Holy Ghost though, but... There's an anointing of of a different type of spirit. The church has enemies. You want me to tell you why? Because there's some people who quit doing drugs when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of them and sanctifies them, and the ones who were selling the drugs to the new church member is very upset with the pastor. And he's really mad with the Holy Ghost, and he's, he's fed up because some of his money has been cut off. Did you know that we get enemies when we've been in a relationship sleeping with somebody we're not married to and we get a good dose of the power of God and we come up out of the altar and say, my God, help me, I'm never gonna do it again. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. I will walk in purity. I will walk in holiness. And guess what? First thing, when you head back home and you get that call, hey, honey, you want me to come over? Guess what happens? You make an enemy quickly because now the one you were sleeping with becomes your mortal enemy and wants to destroy you and wants to destroy your character. But that's where you say, look, I've got a pastor who says that my sins have been forgiven me as far as the east is from the west. Even if I blew it last week, if the blood of Jesus covers me, I'm okay. So you do all the gossiping you want to do. Tell them anything you want to tell them. You'll answer to God for that. But as far as what God has done in my life, I will walk in. In freedom, amen? amen. You start making enemies when you quit hanging out at the bar with the people that you, you slam down some Jack Daniels. I probably just tore up that terminology. I don't guess you slam anything. But I don't know. I don't know how they talk. <clears throat> chugged, chugged some Jack Daniels. Get some of that good whiskey. Now, good. I'm saying that facetiously. Get some of that whiskey. It burns your guts when it goes down, and you sure can't sing afterwards. And all of a sudden, 
the Lord moves and you find yourself saturated with the power of Almighty God and you realize for some reason the taste of that alcohol just doesn't do it for me like I thought it did. For some reason, I can't get out of the altars. Two hours later, they're cutting the lights off, handing me the key saying, hey brother, lock it up and come to my house and give me the key when you leave. I can't get enough of God. So now the buddies I used to get drunk with and we used to cuss up a storm and tell all the dirty jokes you can imagine. Now they're looking looking at me like a traitor and every time they get around me all I can do is say Jesus set me free Jesus set me free and then when they get close to me they feel chills coming all over them and they get hot and they start thinking my goodness we got to get away from him something's all over that boy you make enemies when you decide to walk in victory amen King David had enemies but here's what God's saying He's saying, I prepared a table before you in the presence of those very enemies that I've just been talking about. How many of you know that when you get a good dose of God, sometimes your family thinks it's a fluke? Oh, you've heard that before. Mama, tonight the Lord moved on me. I got knocked out. I don't even know what that means, but I, got, I was on the floor and I woke up 15 minutes later. Pastor was over me waving it. They were some of them old saints just uh, dancing around me. I don't know what it was, Mama, but I've never felt nothing like it. Well, that's good, honey. <laughs> Supper's in the kitchen. <laughs> Did you hear me? Look, folks, unless people are in the atmosphere you're in, they probably will not relate. If they've never tasted of what you're describing, they probably can't get excited and do a a dance in the living room, amen, because they don't really know what you're saying. So don't get discouraged. And when people, the first time you slip up, now I'm not ever condoning to sin ever, 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 but if you slip up, let's say you had trouble cursing, and you let let, let that word come out of your mouth, and you know what they're going to do? Uh-huh, I knew it wasn't real. I knew you didn't get saved. I knew it was just a fluke. And, and so be careful not to become discouraged if you have a slip up, if there's something where, oh, my goodness, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I didn't mean to do that. You know, just move forward and keep attempting to serve God and to please him fully, amen? Amen, that's just good advice for the church. So he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. God, how is it? When I am sitting here at the table and I'm pouring and drinking of that precious fruit of the vine and I'm eating that unleavened bread, what in the world on that table could cause people who have steak and baked potatoes and Texas toast and a big salad bar, why in the world would they be attracted to that kind of stuff, Father? Well, this is the kind of answer I expect from God. It's not necessarily food, unleavened bread and juice. But he says, when they talk about you, show them kindness. When they curse you to your face and you want to slap the mess out of them, tell them I'm praying for you. And I, 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 and my flesh feels a little riled up right now, but I still love you. And I'm believing that God's going to cause you to see what his plan is for your life and you're, you're destined for greatness. My goodness, you tell a sinner that, they might fall out on the floor themselves. In the flesh. You're destined for greatness by the power of God. And they're like, what in the world? Folks, you've got to start speaking life where there's death. You've got to start speaking positive where there ain't no positive to be found, amen. You've got to start looking for the precious jewel within them. See, God's already planted a measure of faith within every person. You would never have gotten saved if God had not given you the measure of faith. So you've got to go looking for that measure within even your worst enemies and let them know I'm praying for you, I'm interceding. Your dreams may get a little crazy, baby, but I tell you, I'm praying for you and God's going to get you. Now, I ain't saying he's going to send you to hell, but I'm saying God's going to revive you. He's going to drive you to a place of perfection. We've got to learn that overflow has less to do with us than it has to do with those around us that God is wanting to bless. Now, I spoke on this just a little bit Wednesday. It's very important. If I'm going to pour out of that pitcher, Miss Deborah, that there's not any severe cracks in it. I feel it's very important for me to share this again tonight because if there are really bad cracks, and I'm talking about the kind where uh, something can leak through, as soon as I lift this pitcher and start to pour about like that, 
you're going to see, now right here's where it needs to be pouring, but you're going to start seeing uh, tea or, or fruit of the vine run down and fall on the bottom, and it's going to get all over the mashed potatoes. It's going to fall in the peas. It's going to get on the corn. You're going to have soggy cornbread at grandma's. Amen. Because there's a crack in the vessel. I wouldn't let Roxy Jane do this, but... There's a crack in the vessel. You know what happens? When there is a crack, the one who lifts it up to pour cannot accurately control the direction of the flow. There's a lot of meat in what I just said. He cannot truly oversee and direct what he's wanting to do in your life when there are cracks in your vessel. You know what God's trying to tell the church? And I'm talking all over the world. He's saying, let me make, me, let me make you whole. Let me perfect you. Let me polish you. Let me get my hands on you and remake you because there's some areas where you've been cracked and where you've been broken. Have you ever seen someone who is anointed but is wounded? That's dangerous. You get someone who is, uh, they get riled up easy because someone says something or, or maybe they were hurt five years ago in another church and just because someone hinted at the same type thing, uh, maybe like, like they wouldn't trust them. But let's say that they were accused of stealing money at another church and they didn't do it. But this next church they're at five years down the road, somebody says, well, I want to make sure I see the checks before you sign them. Well, my goodness, that might offend them because they were accused five years ago. You see what I'm saying? They were cracked five years ago, and because of that, just that, that little motion by uh, the, the next church, it caused that crack to open to a point where they were, it was impossible for the Spirit of God to flow through them. God wants you to know that his anointing First of all, is not cheap. But second of all, that he can't flow through you unless you're whole. Amen? Unless you are complete, unless you are at a place, and trust me, it's not easy to be complete. There's a lot of temptations out there. There's a lot of things we want to indulge in. There's, there's attitudes. When I'm going through the drive through at Jack's, and I just said that, I could, it could be anywhere, going through the drive through and, and they don't get my order right, and I've already went all the way back home, and my wife's like, you better call them. You better tell them they left the mayonnaise off. And I'm thinking, oh, man, okay. <clears throat> and sometimes I'll go back and get something free. But what I'm saying is it's easy to get riled up. Amen. And, and whatever your problem is, whatever your weakness is, you've got to let God make you whole. Amen. Judas Iscariot. And believe it or not, I'm going to go ahead and finish with this. I've been kind of getting short-winded lately. Haven't I? Hallelujah. Hannah's like, I ain't, I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Judas Iscariot, when we last left the upper room, had agreed to betray, yeah, come on up, had agreed to betray Jesus. And yet, Judas experienced overflow. That's weird, isn't it? Here's a guy who's about to turn you over to the, the uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, high priest. Jesus, <clears throat> it, it, imagine if an angel could have stepped foot in the room. Now, Jesus, you know that when this guy does what he's going to do, you're going to be crucified. You're going to be pierced. It's going to hurt like crazy. You're going to hurt worse than almost anybody's ever hurt on this planet. Do you really think it's appropriate to do the foot washing thing? I mean, that, that would have been our thinking. Dude, wash everybody else's feet when Judas leaves. I mean, at least, at least don't go that far. But no, you know what Jesus did? Made a point. Before Judas ever left the room, he says he takes the towel. I'm going to get up here on stage. Takes the towel from around him. It, it means he took something that was a part of him, something that kept him together. Something close to him. He said, I, I, I took the towel and he knelt down. And, and I don't know if you think about this, but the Bible says they were reclined. So they weren't in tall bar stools. They weren't in chairs. They were on the floor. So that tells me Jesus had to get absolutely as low as he could. Mm. Huh. Thank you, Lord. Well, if I run into them at Walmart, I guess I'll, I'll tell them I love them or I forgive them. If I see them pop up on Facebook, I guess it, as long as it's convenient for me, I'll, I'll let them know I love them. Jesus made a point to go to the one who was already planning to betray him. He didn't wait till Walmart. He didn't wait till Facebook turned on and he saw that little green light. Judas is online. No, he didn't wait. You know what he did? 
he knelt down and found the lowest spot in the room and he pulls a towel out <laughs> and there was some kind of a, a, a bowl or something where they had water in in order to wash their feet so he had to slide that near and you know wouldn't you imagine let's call a servant Let, let's get get the kid in the corner will, will you bring the water no he didn't do that king of kings and lord of lords was trying to show the church about overflow it's not about holy ghost revival it's not about shouting and we want all those things but he was saying true overflow he said i prepare a table before you in the presence folks the last supper there was there was an enemy there in the presence of your enemies but don't worry david don't worry jesus because i've anointed you don't worry Stu. don't worry elizabeth don't worry alex and cecilia because i've anointed your heads with oil and just to make it clear your cup that I'm pouring into is overflowing because there's friends there's family there's co-workers there's schoolmates there's enemies that have got to taste and feel the love of God when they curse you out when they hurt you when they stab you in the back they've got to feel love because that's the only way they're going to be drawn to me and as he knelt down he washed Judas's feet you know what was on those feet? Dust from the same path Jesus had walked before they got there. Peter, James, John, Matthew, Thaddeus, Bartholomew, Judas, James, son of Alphaeus, all these guys had walked the same trail in order to get to that same upper room. They'd walked up the same steps. And when Jesus was washing the feet of Judas, you know what he saw? And, I, and I'm adding a little bit here, but I know there was dust, but there was evidence of following in his footsteps this guy knows what it's like to go through the rough times with me this guy knows what it's like for the good times he knows the miracles and he knows the times when everybody leaves me but something's gotten in his heart and it's become corrupted and I see it and it hurts me I don't want Judas to die I know he's betrayed me for the price of a slave I mean Jesus could have thought aren't I worth more than that but no instead of getting all upset instead he kneels down and he gave him overflow it was up to Judas to decide what he did with the overflow I'm going to finish with this but I got to, I got to remind you of one thing I said this morning and I'll, I'll be done you remember the conversation between Jesus and Peter Peter was a different story he was still going to deny that was a type of betrayal but Jesus knew the heart of Peter and here's what overflow said to Peter. Of course, he's washing his feet and he's blessing him and being a Jesus and being a servant. But when he talked about denying, here's where overflow came out. Because if it was me or you, we'd said, you sorry thing. How dare you, how dare you deny me? Don't, wasn't it enough when you walked on the water? Wasn't it enough when you yourself saw me break bread and there's 5,000 men plus women and children? Wasn't it enough? for you to at least make it through the next 24 hours with me when you walked on water. Peter, how in the world can you deny me when you're the, the one who stood up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Thomas ain't even denying me. Peter, it's you. We would have probably said that. But you know what Jesus said? I'll repeat from this morning. Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but... Oh, here comes overflow. Here's what's happening in some of your lives right now. But I prayed for you. <laughs> Apparently somebody, it might be here that wouldn't hear this morning, needs to hear this. But I prayed for you. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Stand with me, church. I want Brother Steve to come forward. I want our ushers to get prepared for communion. All of you, who would be able to take part. This is something you don't have to be a member. I just ask that you be a Christian, that you be a believer. And what we'll do, if you will, just, I should have allowed you to stay seated. I'm sorry. Just sit back down. And when they come by, they're going to motion towards you and they'll offer you that fruit of the vine and the bread. And if you're willing to partake with us, please just take that. You guys go ahead Oh, his presence is so real. 
Brother Steve, I'm going to have you to read, and I've got it here unless you want to look in the Bible, but it's 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24 is where, where that line goes to. That'll be for the bread. is not God given us some revelation about this Last Supper? My goodness. We partake of Christ in order to overflow to those who least deserve it. Because there was a time where someone else was partaking and it was for us. There was a time where somebody else prayed and they could have been praying for a new car, a boat, a house, miracles for their family. and Instead, they prayed for us. You know what they were doing? They were overflowing into you. And thank God that they were willing to do it. I'm going to ask Brother Steve to read those two scriptures and he's going to lead us in prayer and then if you will, thank you if you will, just wait on the fruit of the vine until I read the next scriptures go ahead brother 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24 for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking about real quick, if, yeah. I, if I may. So this isn't the first time they've heard something like this. Mm. Um, last week you had preached uh, the day that Jesus was with many more than 12 disciples. Yes. And he made the statement. He says, you know, if you're going to be with me, then you've got to eat my flesh yes. and drink my blood. Yes. And some of the disciples says, Lord, that's a hard, hard saying. Man. How can anybody do that? And it says, they left him. Then he looked at Peter and he says, Oh, my. <laughs> glory to God. He said, will you also? Yeah. Oh, glory. Mm. Peter said, but Lord, what are you talking about? Where would we go? That's it. I mean, you have the, the, the answer. Yes. Amen? Yes. You have the words of eternal life. And Jesus, the first time I believe it's Capernaum, he referred to himself. He says, I am the bread of life. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we know that partaking of the bread, Father, as it is broken, as it is here in the oven leaven state, God, is, is your body being broken on the cross for us. And you said, Father, that we must, we must, if we're going to be your disciple, your apostle, that we must partake of the same persecution of the same suffering, God, that you had. God, we are no better. God, that you said that you are the bread of life, and for me to follow you, I have to partake of this same bread. So, Father, right now, we ask you to bless this, this bread, to sanctify it to our bodies, Father, God, and through this, Lord, it is done in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake of the bread. the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes let's pray thank you for the blood thank you for the blood that washes our sins away thank you Jesus for being willing to to go through your own plan of suffering. We didn't choose it, and I wish you had not had to, but Lord, you chose to prove your love through this horrible act of crucifixion. And God, I sure am thankful that, Lord, you showed the world what you really felt and what, you, what we meant to you. But Lord, right now, as we partake of this cup, I pray, God, that it will be a symbol of us partaking in your sufferings and in your blood. We give you all glory and thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Spend a moment and worship him. Spend a moment and worship him. 